Hello YouTube world, Stephanie Jarvis here, your mushroom mentor. Today we are going to prepare some grain jars for mushroom cultivation. So if you like my videos, don't forget to like, subscribe, ding the bell to get the whistles, and enjoy the show. Also, if you'd like a free consultation call, please reach out to me at my mushroom mentor email. All right, here we go. Cleanliness in the kitchen, before you do any kind of grain cultivation, the kitchen is a dirty place. You do dirty dishes, you clean, you cook, you're in and out of here a lot. So before you do any kind of mushroom cultivation in your kitchen, A, we want to shower, we want to clean and scrub our fingernails. We want to put on fresh, clean clothes. Typically, you want to have all your hair pulled up and out of the way. And you also want to clean the kitchen. So I cleared off this whole bench area, which is normally full of spices and, you know, salt and peppers and the stuff I use for cooking every day. And then I did a diluted bleach solution and scrubbed it down really good. And then I sprayed it with 91% isopropyl alcohol and just let that spray settle to the, for the area to dry. And now I feel a little bit more confident that this area is less dirty because there's really no such thing as sterile. Sterilization is just a cleaning process to get all the bacteria and mold spores out of the way. Um, so I feel like this area is a little bit cleaner than it was before. So um, clean your kitchen prior to doing um, you know, any of these processes, if you want. <laughs> All right, folks, we're here in the kitchen today. We're going to make up some grain jars. And the first thing I did was I took a five pound bag of rye grain and I put it in a pot, which is here. I filled it up with water, I stirred it up, I poured out the water, and then I filled it up again with water. And then I let it just soak overnight. Here's the bag, five pound bag of grain that I purchased online at a beer, just a beer, you know, to make beer uh, company. And this grain particularly was really, really dirty. So you never know what you're going to get unless you get a reliable source that you go to a lot. You really want to get clean grain if you can. Sometimes you just get dirty batches. So as you can see here, see how dirty this water is? I've actually changed this water out many times. You can see how mucky it is. And so I am going to stir it up, drain it out, fill it back up. And then I'm going to add some, first some oyster shell, some calcium carbonate. And this is going to raise the pH. We want the pH to be up around eight. And then I'm going to add some gypsum. And gypsum is going to lock that pH in place and stabilize it throughout the process. Now, a couple of things about why we're soaking the grain um, is because you want it to hydrate. You want it to get at um, maximum hydration before we put it in the grain jars because the grain is going to be food for our fungal cultivars that we're going to then inoculate the grain, the grain with. And you don't want it to be too overcooked. You don't want it to be too soggy and mushy. You can get it overcooked, um, but you do want it at... Um, about 95% hydration rate. So um, the way to do that is to uh, soak it overnight, and then we're going to add gypsum and oyster shell. And then what we're going to do, because it's really dirty, no matter even if it looks clean, it's still dirty, is there are mold spores, endospores, sp specific type of very hard shelled spore in and around every single grain in here. And we want to activate those spores to germinate prior to our sterilization process. So I'm going to add these two ingredients. First, I'm going to drain it, rinse it again. 
I usually say three times, but I'm going to do it. This is going to be five times because it's pretty dirty. I'm going to add these two ingredients. Then I'm going to drain and rinse it again, add the two ingredients. And then I'm going to put it over on the stove and we're going to bring it up to a boil. Let it hard boil for mm, not very long, like 30 seconds. You just want to get it really boiling and then we're going to shut off the stove. We're going to let it cool down for about... Uh, a half an hour, 45 minutes to an hour, you want it to be cool enough to touch. Um, not cool overnight, but you want to be able to get it right when you can like start working with it. And then we're going to fill the jars and then get the jars prepped for the pressure cooker. All right, folks, I'm going to do all that stuff without you, you know, having to watch, but I'll be right back. All right. Right, so when you're deciding on what type of jars to use, there are so many options when it comes to going and buying them at Walmart, Target, online, any kind of canned, jarred <coughs> supply company. <coughs> Excuse me. I prefer wide mouth jars over the, the not so wide mouth jars, uh, the mason jar type. Um, it's really a personal preference and it depends on what type of substrate you're putting in the jars and it also depends on what you need to use them for. If you're doing brown rice flour cakes, you want them to be, see how it has a tapered, so it's thinner at the top and wider at the bottom because you're going to birth the cakes, you're going to get them out. If you're going to do just grain and you're going to be breaking up the grain, throughout the process because you're going grain to grain or grain to another substrate for growing out. These ones with the not so wide lid is totally fine. Um, there are lots of options. I bleach and scrub them and store them upside down without the lid uh, in between uses. And then when I go to use them, I go ahead and throw them through the dishwasher again just because I like my grain to be clean, so I take extra precautionary measures. It's not necessary. I could just put some isopropyl alcohol, put these on a clean towel to drain and dry. They are also going to go into the pressure cooker and get pressure cooked, which is essentially an autoclave. So they're going to get, quote, sterilized anyways. So it depends on what kind of jar you want to use. It's up to you. I always use pretty much now, even though I have a bunch of these kind of just littered throughout my collection of jars, um, I prefer wide mouth jars for various reasons. And that's just over experience and personal preference. I'm also going to do some unicorn bags. Unicorn is a company that creates, um, you can buy them online through unicornbags.com. I'm not an affiliate for them, but they already have filter patches on them. You can also make your own bags with Ziplocs and do um, tiny pours with pinholes at the top if you're doing oyster mushrooms or shiitake blocks. Um, you can also install your own filter patch bags with using Tyvek, just cutting up a Tyvek suit, taping them on. Um, and, but the Ziploc bags do not do well in the pressure cooker. So unless you're using pasteurizing, uh, materials, uh, you know, like 120 degree waters, if you have like an Insta water heater, etc. Anyways, I'm going on and on, but, um, the unicorn bags are specifically made for autoclaves. So they do not melt and adhere to the side of your pressure cooker. Um, so I would suggest reaching out to them. They will send you a free sample selection of different sizes of bags. If you tell them that you're going to be buying them in bulk. And, um, anyway, so we're also going to be using unicorn bags. So that's my little tidbit on jars. <laughs> okay. So now we have the rinsed grain here on the stove. And unfortunately, I can't find my pH meter. Typically, I like to use my, my handheld pH meter after I've calibrated it, and that'll give me a very good reading. I have to result to my um, pH strips, which do an okay job. And we're really looking for a ballpark. We're not, um, you know, needing an, an exact pH. 
So just the water, as, as you can actually, to save money if you have to use these, you can actually cut these in half and um, that way you don't have to, uh, you know, use one. If there's 50 and you cut them in half, you have 100. That's what I'm trying to say. So we're just gonna stick it in. Wait a second. See where we're at. Let that come to its <coughs> color mark. <coughs> it's just grain and water, so it should be about seven. I'm just gonna be in this green range. And while we're waiting for that, I'm gonna talk about filter patches. Now, when we put the lids, we're just gonna skip over the lids really quick. When we put the lids on the grain jars, we're going to put the lid um, without the center solid piece. So just the ring. Hold on a second. So we're just going to use the ring and a filter patch and not the, the metal disc that goes inside here. And that's what we're going to put on the tops of the jars. You can buy these online in bulk. You can use Tyvek suits. You can put you can drill holes in the metal disc and use, I mean, there's all kinds of ways of doing that. Um, but if you're going to use the metal disc, you always want to flip it upside down so it's rubber side up, not rubber side to the glass, because if it's rubber side to the glass, it'll seal too well and it won't allow your mycelium to breathe while it's cultivating, uh, growing in the jar. So I prefer to use the um, filter pat, the filter method because of my training working at mushroom farms. So I just do it that way. But there are more ways to skin the cat when it comes to mushroom cultivation, as you probably know by now. Okay, so we are definitely here in the green zone, the green to yellow zone. So we definitely need to raise the pH up a full point. So I'm going to add a couple tablespoons of oyster shell. We're gonna stir it in. So you can go and fast forward from here. Okay, so I added two tablespoons of the oyster shell and we're waiting to see how much it raised the pH, which may not have been very much. So I'm prob I usually add um, several tablespoons. Um, without looking at my notes, I'm kind of going off of memory here. But um, another good point is always take notes and always look at your notes from the last time you did this because that will always clue you into where you're going with this. Okay, well, we have the grain here on the stove now, and I am checking it for pH with my pH strips. I have so far added in um, four heaping tablespoons of oyster shell and one of gypsum, and that seems to be doing us the trick. Um, I'm going to add a little bit more gypsum. And I'm also taking notes. So make sure that you're always taking notes of what you've done and in the same notebook so that you can go back and look at your notes from previous times. That way you can have better chances of troubleshooting if you seem to forget a step or um, you know what you did last time versus what you're doing this time if you're experimenting. And um, again, we have five pounds of grain in here because I don't know how to do a small batch. I just go big or go home every time and um we soaked it overnight we did five water changes one last night and then the rest this morning until i got pretty much clean water and now i'm going to turn on the stove and i'm going to bring it up to a boil and then i'm going to turn off the stove after it's got a hard boil on it let that um reduce temperature, drain it, strain it, and then we're going to put it in our jars. All right, on to the next step. I just wanted to add a little side note about pressure cookers. When I use my pressure cooker, I wash it before, and I spray it with a little alcohol, and I let it dry before I'm going to use it. And then I use it, and then I wash it, and let it dry completely and I store it closed 
and then I will wash it again before I use it again. Just for good measure to make sure I keep the spore load of any mold or bacteria off of the surface areas. Even though I am going to um, pressure cook, which is essentially autoclaving, I still want to keep the interior and exterior of the pressure cooker as clean as I can because it is going to end up in the lab. So you do want the outside clean, excuse me, clean. And then of course you want the inside clean because that's where you're doing your sterile technique. Now the rubber here on the inside is replaceable and it can dry out, especially if you're using alcohol, a lot of alcohol, you don't really need a lot. Right now it's wet because of water. And if you need to keep this rubber nice and soft, you want it nice and soft and pliable, you don't want it to get hard and brittle, you can use a very thin layer of, um, of oh gosh, of petroleum jelly. Thank you, mind. <laughs> you can use a very thin layer of petroleum jelly just super thin along the surface and the outside, and that will keep your rubber sealing doing its job, and it will also keep it nice and pliable for a good period of time. Now, you wanna be very gentle with the actual pressure gauge. I have, um, and you can t check it on the inside. You want it, even with your hands, you can see if it's any movement. You don't want it to move. And over time, they do get beat up, and I've replaced several um, because this does stick out. They can get dinged, bent, etc., and then they're not accurate. So they're easily purchased online and easily replaced. Now the rocker are also easily lost and easily replaced. So I always store mine on the inside of the pressure cooker and not on top because it can easily fall off and get lost. So I currently have more rockers than I have pressure cookers right now. Um, I don't know how that ended up, but I must have ordered one with a lost one and then found it at some point. And then of course, this is your separator on the inside, which is good to go at the bottom. And then you can also do another layer midway between layers of jars if you want. You can use wire. Uh, I've used rocks and bricks and all kinds of stuff to keep the bags off the very bottom of the of the pressure cooker because you don't want your bag sitting in water when they're inside the uh the pressure cooker because you don't want the filter patch to get wet the jars are okay because the lids is where the filter patch is and that's going to be further up uh, out of the water but with with the unicorn bags or any bags you have with filter patches you want to keep that filter patch dry and out of being just soaked with water. Um, all right, so that's that about pressure cookers. On to the next step. Okay, we're not quite to boiling yet, but the, here's our five pounds of grain. And it's like a cauldron of, you know, like a witch's brew. And you can hear the dishwasher in the background doing a quick rinse on jars. So just want to keep stirring it, get the bottom to the top, the sides to the middle, the middle to the outside. It's like a big cauldron, like a big witch's brew of grain, or a big brewer's brew of grain. Anyway, so we're gonna let that, I'm gonna bang a lid on it and let it keep going. So if you want to use your actual metal disc for the, well that was too big. For like making a, a, a portal for doing uh, inoculation with a needle. You can use micropore tape and you can also use a type of silicone that you get at the auto parts store. It's for sealing up parts of a vehicle so it can really take high heat and cooling, heating and cooling and heating and cooling. And you put it on both sides of the lid and let it dry. And then, well actually first, sorry, let me go back. You use a nail to make a hole and then you put the, the silicone, the heat resistant silicone on both sides 
and now you have a seal up port essentially so when you have this on top of your jar you can inoculate with a needle and this particular type of silicone is going to seal up that hole and then you can put micropore tape over here so you have a little bit of breathing room again always with the rubber side up in your jars so that's one way to use jar lids for putting in ports for uh, you know if you have spore syringes that you want to inoculate with and and then also with micropore tape so you have a little bit of an air filter so there's another tidbit for you on um, here's a nice clean one these ones are a little bit funky rusty but they still work so there's no sense in throwing this out I rarely ever use these um, but at one point I was using them a lot so um, these are perfect for if you're doing brown rice flour cakes, which we'll get to in a little while. All right, next up. Are we ready yet? Oh, we're getting so close. We are still, it's hot, but it's not boiling. Lid back on. Ooh, I can hear it boiling. It's hot. Look at that. That is a hard boil. I'm gonna turn the stove off, give it a stir, let it cool. We're only gonna let it cool until I feel brave enough to pick this big pot up, take it over to the stove, and start to drain it out. So I say 30 minutes, but I might do it sooner than that okay while I'm waiting for this to cool I can get my um, pressure cooker set up so this is a tall boy I forget how many quarts this is but I'm going to place the liner in at the bottom and then I'm going to put in seven jars and then I'm, I might use a layer of aluminum foil with holes because I don't have enough of these guys. Or if you have enough of, of these liners, you could put in a layer of this. And then I'm going to put two unicorn bags on top. And I think I have enough grain to be able to do at least 14 jars. We're not filling the jars all the way up. Enough to do 14 jars and maybe four bags. We'll see how far five pounds of green are going to let us go today. All right, here we go. Okay, I waited a whole like 30 seconds because I don't want to be doing this all day. But normally, you know, if you did this step, sometimes you let it cool overnight. Depends on how hot of substrate you want to work with. And so I just slid it over to the edge and I'm going to pour some out and fill up some jars. Um, a good way to fill up jars is using a measuring cup, which I will give a good rinse, spray with some isopropyl alcohol. And... All right, we can speed this up and let you watch. Three quarters of the way full. Clean the lid area. No grain around the top of the lid. So it's clean. your lid on it, put it in the pressure cooker. Mm. 
You want your grains to pop when you crush them with your fingers, just pop. Not mush, not like soggy oatmeal, but you want the grains to be firm and able to just pop. Do your best to try not to put your fingers in the jar when you're trying to clean it off. Because fingers have been who knows where throughout the day. If you haven't washed your hands every 30 seconds with soap and water and bleach during the day, likely you're going to have bacteria on your hands. So each time you reach your hand in the jar to clean off the jar, you're actually inviting a bacterial infection in your grain, even though you're about to put these in the autoclave the pressure cooker. So try to just use a clean towel a couple of times for one towel per couple of jars. And try to do your best to keep your freaking hands, my freaking hands, <laughs> out of these stinking jars. Here we go. See my hands in the jar, but I'm trying to not touch the jar with my fingers, I'm trying to get this towel to wipe the grain off the sidewalls. And also, this is burning hot. I almost forgot the aluminum foil. Not too tight, gently snug. The aluminum foil keeps water particles from getting that filter patch soaking wet. Now you can use autoclave tape if you want. That will tell you, you see the white lines? You can't see the white lines here, but they are, you can see them there. When this is correctly and properly brought up to temperature in a pressure cooker for a certain amount of time, these lines will turn dark black and you will know that it has been autoclaved or pressure cooked for long enough and at heat hot enough. And um, so you can put this in seal jars, um, particularly if we're doing um, agar, we'll use uh, autoclave tape. But in this process, we just put the lid on and the aluminum foil and then put this into the pressure cooker. So this is what happens when you move too many times, you end up with a collection of big lids and little lids. Now these fancy lids, these ones are my favorite to use. These ones you get from specialty canning stores. And apparently I only have one knowing that I have purchased these many, many times in bulk and I currently can only find one. But these are my favorite to use for the smaller patches. They just fit nicely on the inside, no gaps. And then it's a smaller surface area that still allows air exchange for your mycelium to grow, but it's not just one big area. So it's just less contamination, um, op, um, less contamination that can get in the jar. Possibly, maybe not.
All right, so there's seven jars, seven jars in a pressure cooker. And you wanna put in enough water so that it goes midway, a little more than a quarter of the way up the jar when all the jars are in the water. So I could afford to put a little more water in here than that since I'm going to put more substrate in the, in the cooker. You can actually see here along the wall, see how it's dark? You can see, and that is up to my third knuckle. That's about where I put the water level each time. It will stain the inside of your cooker. I actually put too much in here. You can see how the water comes all the way up to the neck. There's actually too much, too much water in here. So now I'm going to take some out just for good measure. You can see the lot, well, stain line is there and I filled it up to here with the jars out of it. So I gotta take some water out. So now we're at the, the last part of the, the bottom of the five pounds that we cooked up. And you can see there is some, this is oyster shell that was concentrated at the bottom of the pot that is now here on the top of the pile. And this is all I have to do bag culture with. I don't have much left. We've done 14 jars and we have this much left out of the five pounds. And so I'm going to do two bags. They'll be kind of thin bags, but that's okay. And um, I'm just not going to worry. Just don't even worry about this oyster shell because the calcium carbonate mushroom mycelium actually likes. And I've never had a problem with, you know, you got to stir and stir and stir. But the oyster shell is actually shells of oysters ground up and they have weight to them and they like to sink to the bottom. So unless you have a mixer that's constantly mixing in there, it's going to settle out of the water column in your stock pot. So no problem. Now we're gonna speed it up and let you watch me bag some, bag them up instead of jar them up. You don't wanna get it on the outside of your bag. I, I tried to use a, a larger cup and it's just making a mess. So I'm gonna go back to a smaller measuring stick unit. It's neater and you can aim it better in the bag. I'm gonna put about half of this in here. It's pretty wet. So a really big bag for the amount that we're going to do. I want to do more than one. So again with this. This is a very specific way of folding your bag. Okay, and it will help you keep your stair your cultures clean. Okay, I promise you. Filter forward. Use the seams of the bag, and you want to fold it over so that there are no wrinkles. The least filter to filter. Now 
just like a perfect accordion with no, I'm going to tuck it, with no um, wrinkles. But the next thing we need is a, we need another layer. I need to put another layer in the pot, not just setting this on top of your jars. You need a layer so that there's steam that goes on the top of the jars and steam that also hits the bottom of this. So I need to go get another unit from a pressure cooker. I'll be right back. Okay, so I went and got another one of these. I'm going to set on top of the jars. You see this stain? This is actually caked on, cooked on plastic. This is what happens if you use a Ziploc bag in your pressure cooker. It will cook on, glue on, and then never ever come off. So don't use Ziploc bags. So we're gonna do that. I'm actually gonna do it like that. And then the grain bag is going to go right on top. All right. Now, I'm not using a larger cup or just dumping it in because I want to get it not on the sides and all over the kitchen. I want to actually get it in here. So there's a method to my small scooper madness. So this is a little bit bigger than the last one I made. This is about the size of a shiitake block. I didn't count how many measuring uh, cups went in here. This is actually a half cup. So, but that's okay. It went just to, just above the bottom line of the filter patches um, where the level is. So we want to actually, And wind this so you have the reason why I wound it up is because this area is now grain free okay and when we inoculate this bag we are actually going to use a seam sealer and we are going to seal this and you don't want any grain goop in the way so that is why I did a very meticulous fold over like I do my sleeves to get the sleeves out of the way, to get the plastic out of the way, you fill it up. So I get almost down to the grain, the top of the filter patch. And then um, I'm going to find the, the seams. I'm going to fold this in, pushing out the air. And I'm making this seam on here so that there are no wrinkles. And then I am folding it over so it's patch face to patch face of the two filter patches. And then I just go ahead and continue accordion um, folding with no seams because again, if there are wrinkles in it, then there'll be wrinkles become a problem later on when you're trying to seal the bag up. So just fold these in on the ends and you can see it's just nice and organized little package. Okay, now you see I have my two grain bags on top of the separator and underneath are seven jars and then in here are seven jars. So five pound bags. We did 14 jars and two, they could have been more evenly dispersed, the two bags, but that's okay. Anyways. <laughs>